So I want to look at 1 Kings chapter 18. And I'm going to read uh, starting in verse 30. And then I'm going to give you a little background on what we're, where we're at here. So verse 30 says, Then Elijah said to all the people, Come near to me. So all the people came near to him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. And Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. So with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench around the altar, large enough to hold two measures of seed. Basically that word seed, that's six gallons of water. A seed was about three gallons. This is six gallons of water that he's putting out there. And in verse 33 it says, Then he arranged the wood and cut the ox in pieces and laid it on the wood. And he said, Fill four pitchers with water and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. And he said, Do it a second time. And they did it a second time. And he said, Do it a third time. They did it a third time. The water flowed around the altar and he also filled the trench with water. And at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, today let it be known that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant, and I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you are, O Lord, are God, and that you have turned their heart back again. And then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. So we are living in a time in which Chuck Colson said in the early 90s that it was post-Christian, that, that we are living in a country and in a world in general that is post-Christian. And so we're finding out here in this story, this is the account of Elijah Ahab is king. His wife Jezebel rules with him. And so there's a lot happening here. And so if you'll remember, Elijah prayed three and a half years earlier that it would not rain. And for three and a half years, it has not rained. And there's a drought. There's a famine in the land. And so he now appears back on the scene and Of course, Ahab is not happy with him. In verse 17 of that chapter, it says, When Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, Is this you, you troubler of Israel? And he said, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have, because you have forsaken the commandment of the Lord, and you have followed the Baals. There's a lot to be said about just that statement right there. To the godless people, godly people will always be troublesome. Let me say it again. To godless people, godly people will always be troublesome. They will accuse those of us who believe in biblical Christianity, the absolute truth of the Word of God, the exclusivity of Jesus Christ as the only Savior of the world. They will always consider us who believe such things to be the problem. I mean, they would just tell you the world would be rid of all hate if y'all Christians would just accept Anything and everything. But truth is really fluid. That it changes based on culture and time and progression. And if Christians would just grab a hold of that fact. That truth is not always the same thing. That it's not the same yesterday, today and forever. That there are changes due to cultural acceptance. If, If Christians would just get a hold of this. We wouldn't have any trouble. If y'all wouldn't get upset about what we're teaching in school uh, about gender and sexuality, if y'all would just calm down that. Somebody said to me last week, Bucky, it seems like you're always talking about this trans issue and homosexuality. Why are you always doing it? Because culture continuously throws it up there. So what they say is if you, if you disagree with that and you have scripture that says, you stand on the word of God, they call you trouble. For them, I'm trouble. And so, it hasn't changed. This is not new. So here's what I want you to know. That this happening, the things happening in our culture today aren't new. Anytime righteousness makes a stance, wickedness gets in a tizzy. How you like that? Okay. So, 
They're having this confrontation. Elijah shows up. Nobody's been able to find him three and a half years. When he shows up, King Ahab said, you're the trouble. You're the trouble. And so he makes this. Elijah says, here's what we're going to do. In verse 20, he says, Ahab, he said, in verse 19, now send them and gather to me all Israel at Mount Carmel together with 450 prophets of Baal, 400 prophets of Asherah, who ate at Jezebel's table. He said, listen, get your 450 prophets of Baal, idolaters, call up your wife Jezebel, who are feeding 400 other false prophets. Y'all meet me at Mount Carmel. And we're going to have this little thing. In verse 20, he said, So Ahab sent a message among all the sons of Israel, and brought the prophets together at Mount Carmel. Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you hesitate between two opinions? So Elijah's talking to this group of people that are Israelites and y'all have been awful quiet. How long y'all going to be quiet? How long y'all going to sit there acting like you don't know what's going on? If you're from the country, how long you going to be there like a, like a calf staring at a new gate? That's what he's saying. So I, the Lord God, if I'm the Lord God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people did not answer him a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I alone am left a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. Now we're going to find out later that that's not exactly true. But that's how Elijah felt. Elijah felt it's me against the world. There were 7,000 prophets of God holed up somewhere. But Elijah right now, as far as Elijah is concerned, I'm the only one here doing what God's called me to do. Now let them give us two oxen and let, them, and let them choose one ox for themselves and cut it up and place it on the wood. But put no fire under it and I will prepare the other ox and lay it on the wood. And I will not put a fire under it. Then you call on the name of your God and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. And the people said, that's a good idea. Now here's what Elijah's saying. I'm not worried if you want to bring your pagan people to the party and pray to your pagan God. I'm all about it. Matter of fact, let's just see who answers. First, that's not Elijah being cocky and arrogant. That's Elijah saying, I'm under the hand of God. And I'm going to ask God to do what God told me he said he would do. So I'm going to be obedient in it. And so they all got together there. And Elijah said, you get your own ox, choose which one you want, cut it up, put it on there. Verse 26, then they took the ox which was given them, and they prepared it and called on the name of Baal from morning till noon, saying, oh, Baal, answer us. But there was no voice, and no one answered, and they leaped about the altar which they made. It came about at noon that Elijah, <laughs> I'm telling you, this is why I like Elijah, because he's talking smack. In verse 20, so it came out noon, and Elijah mocked him and said, Call out with a loud voice, for he is, is a God. Either he's occupied or gone aside. Who's was on a journey. Perhaps he is asleep and needs to be awake. So every once in a while, people go, Well, preachers, y'all don't need to be so sarcastic and punchy. <laughs> There's Elijah. Elijah's going, I'm just telling you, talking smack. I'm telling you what, here's what happened when I was growing up. When I go to the basketball game, I'd be saying, get your coat, your brim, and get on out my gym. That's what I'm saying. That's where I'm going with that. Y'all can't, y'all can't say them cheers today. Some of y'all remember this one, U-G-L-Y, you ain't got no alibi, you ugly. Hey, hey, you ugly. Y'all remember that one? Y'all can't do that today. Y'all be tossed out. Y'all know y'all would. We got any cheerleaders in the house? If you're a cheerleader, raise your hand. If you, if you, no, not, I'm talking about current day, Jennifer, current day. I'm not, I'm talking about current day. Jennifer back there, Jennifer Martin. Now I got you, preacher. We got any current day cheerleaders? Any, I'm not going to make fun of you today. Any current day cheerleaders? Anybody? Thank Right, right, who are we pointing at? Right there? Loretta, right there. We got some right there. I'm talking, any high school, middle school cheerleaders? Y'all are scared. <laughs> right there. I see y'all back there. I dare y'all. I double dog dare you go back to cheerleading camp with these cheers. 
watermelon, watermelon, watermelon Ryan. Look at the scoreboard. See who's behind. Hey, you. <laughs> and then go right into U-G-L-Y. Because you see the transition. It's hey, you. And then you go into U-G-L-Y. You ain't got no alibi. You ugly. <laughs> there are people here for the first time. They're going, is this church? So we got this, here it is, the mocking preacher right here. He's calling some talking smack, talking to him, getting to him, and all this kind of stuff. And so in verse 28, so they cried with a loud voice and cut themselves according to their custom with swords and lances until the blood gushed out of them. And when midday was passed, they raved until the time of the offering and the evening off sacrifice, but there was no voice, no one answered, no one paid attention. And Elijah said to all the people, come near me. So all the people came near him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been done. So here they are. They're worn out. They're worn out. Because that's what false religion does. It beats you up and wears you out. It asks for a lot of activity without any, any achievement. It just wears you out. And so we're going to see how it takes, how it takes to restore this altar. The first thing is the foundation is everything. Verse 32, so with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench around the altar large enough to hold two measures of seed. That's six gallons of water. So he says, we got this altar right here. But the foundation, so in 1 Corinthians 3.11, it says there's no other foundation but the one that you can build in Jesus Christ. The foundation, everything, from where you start from is where you're going to go to. So if your foundation's bad, your finish is going to be worse. So what's your foundation? What's the foundation of your life? What's your biblical worldview? What's the foundation of your family? What's the foundation of your, your thought? How you look at the world? Is it a biblical worldview or is it based on something else? Your marriage, for instance. How, what, what's the foundation of your marriage? Is your marriage built on Christ? Is your parenting based on Jesus Christ? How you do business? How you treat others? What's the foundation? So notice, he's, he's saying right here, there's no other foundation I'm going to lay right now. We're going to do this according to the name of the Lord. And when you do this in the name of the Lord, that means the nature of the Lord is going to be present in it. There's going to be godly attitudes and actions in what we're doing. The foundation makes the function capable. If your foundation is not in Jesus, your functions won't be in Jesus. It's not going to work. They're not married up together. So he starts out with the right foundation. If you do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you can't repair, you can't restore. And the reason is because you hadn't been redeemed. So if you don't know Jesus, you can't repair the altar, but you can certainly come to the altar. And the altar being the cross. And I'm telling you right now, it is urgent right now. We, Right now, you need to understand with urgency that today is the day of the Lord. Do not harden your heart as you hear Him call Him today. Today is the day of salvation. You need to be saved today. Today. There's no joking around here. It's today. None of us are guaranteed anything past this day. And we say that, and sometimes you'll hear preachers say that. Oh, look, he's trying to scare me now. No, I'm trying to tell you today. Today. When my dad told me if I didn't do something, he was going to whip me, he wasn't making a threat to scare me. He was motivating me. Because I knew he was going to whip me. You understand that? So I didn't want to get a whipping. Now, some of y'all, let me, some of y'all. Whipping. It's a form of punishment that used to be used by parents. It happened about the same time that phones were attached to walls. Okay. So I, I just knew that. So my dad didn't want to whip me. So he was telling me, I don't want to whip you. You don't want to whip him, but what you need to do is get what I'm saying done. Y'all all right? And so here it is right here. I just want you to understand this. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm trying to warn you. There is going to be hell to pay. 
if you have no grace, if you don't know Jesus Christ, that's not, a, that's not me scaring you. That's me throwing out a warning. And so I'm just telling you right now. So he's, he's laying this foundation. So if your foundation is Jesus and maybe you've kind of stepped away from there, you got to remember, it's a drought. So water is a valuable commodity. In these ancient times, water was always a valuable commodity. But water, when you're talking about in, in relationship to the Holy Spirit, is about satisfaction. It, it's about having a thirst always satisfied. Remember, Jesus told the lady at the well, Listen, I am the water of life. Anyone who comes to me and drinks, he will no longer thirst. That I am this well of living water. So he's putting down here that which satisfies the soul. So he's saying, listen, I'm introducing something. I'm going to introduce water here. This water is a symbol of the Holy Spirit in my life. That It brings security. It brings satisfaction. It, it brings hope and refreshing. That's what this water's all about. And so he's telling the people when he's doing this, God's going to do something to refresh you. God's going to do something to satisfy you. God's going to do something that's going to secure you. And when you get right and you come to the altar, are you listening to me? You get right and you get that altar right. God starts bringing satisfaction to your life. God starts bringing security to your life. God starts bringing refreshment to your life. That's what aggravates me sometimes when we take the altar out of worship. See, when we, when we talk about the altar here, it, it is, it's, it's, it's symbolism, but it's symbolism of substance. When we talk about this altar, and when I'm calling people to the altar, I'm not calling people here to just kind of, let's see how many people get to the altar. No, I'm calling people to the altar because I'm saying, hey, listen, I want you to move in obedience to what God would have you do. There are times, there are times. This morning I was praying. This morning I was praying. And, I, 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 and here's, I'm, I'm just be just transparent with you as I can, okay? Be as transparent as I can. Because y'all know, usually I'm just so hidden. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm, I'm just telling you, all week long I've been fighting a dry spirit. You ever had a dry spirit? When you're sitting there and you're praying to God and you think God's, I mean, you think God's the, 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 the God of Baal. He's turned away, gone to sleep or something. You ever had those times when you're praying? Where God's hidden his face from you? Any witnesses in the room? And so I'm, I'm there at my desk and I'm praying, Lord Jesus, I just read Psalm 123. Let me just, let me tell you. Let me tell you. And I'm, I'm going to be finished here in just a second. It's going to blow y'all's mind. Psalm 123. Oh man, somebody moved Psalms. This is what it said. Here, here's what he says in, in Psalm. It's a short, short psalm. To you I lift up my eyes, O you who are enthroned in the heavens. Behold, as the eyes of a servant look to the hand of their master, and as the eyes of the maid to the hand of their mistress, her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God until he is gracious to us. I said, God, I need you to be gracious to me today. Because sometimes you just pray through Psalms. God, I need you to be gracious to me today. I need your graciousness on my life, Lord. I just, I feel so dry. I feel so unrefreshed. God, I think, I think your face is turned from me. And God, if you just help me understand why your face. Because sometimes God will turn his face from you just to get you to seek it. For no other reason than to seek it. For we are greatly filled with contempt. That means, Lord, I, I'm so filled with contempt. I don't, think, I don't think I'm worthy to call you because you're not, you're not talking to me. So, Lord, I, I'm looking down on me because you're ignoring me. Our soul is greatly filled with the scoffing of those who are at ease and with the contempt of the proud. Lord, nobody's listening to you. I mean, the people that are, the, there are people that are full of pleasure, they're ignoring you. There are people that are scoffing at those who trust in you. 
And so, God, I, I, need, I need you to do something today. And in, 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 in context of even this sermon where it says, so that the people will know you're God. But I even made it personal. I need to know you're God today, Lord. And I'm sitting there praying this, and this is, I'm getting somewhere about the altar. And for no reason whatsoever, I feel the work of the Holy Spirit say, get on your knees. And this is what I did. I ain't, that's, what's that about? Now I'm asking God to do something, and I want Him to speak, and the first thing I hear is get on your knees, and I act like God ain't said nothing. Because I'm sitting there going, what does it matter if I'm on my knees? I'm talking to you. Why is it mattering on my knees? There's no secret to praying on your knees. Now some of y'all go, oh yeah, there is. But it would not leave me on so I got on my knees. Then he said, get on your face. I argued with him. I know y'all don't do stuff like this. I don't know if I said, Lord, I'm, okay. Now what? Ask me again. And believe me this time. Now I wish I could tell you that, man, it, I mean, you wouldn't believe what happened. I felt the earthquake, wind blow. I felt nothing. I felt nothing. But I trusted everything. Are y'all listening? These prophets of Baal, they were dancing around, hooping and hollering. All kind of nonsense. Nothing happened. But what Elijah did was act in obedience to building an altar. There's nothing fancy about it. Puts a trench around there. Puts the water that symbolizes. Then he calls for fire. Fire is another symbol of the Holy Spirit. It's about his purity, his presence, and his power. So he's putting this water around here. Lord, refresh us. And then he's going to call down the fire. He says, now Lord, consume us. Consume us. And it's the, the putting of the ox on there, it's, 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 it has some, some significance to the sin offering. But it was also a praise offering. But here's what I do know. It was consuming and it was pleasing. And it wasn't out of control. But the thing also, there was an order to it. He built that altar with a foundation, stone by stone, wood by wood, piece by piece with the ox. You know why? Because God's about order. God is not a God of chaos. God's not a God of confusion. God's got order. He has a plan. He has assignments for us. And in that assignment is our alignment. And that alignment is in our attitudes and our actions. In the family, for instance, he has assignments for us. The Bible tells us that the father is the head of the household. And then there's the wife. And then there are children. And each one of those are, are act this way and, and supposed to do this way. And so if I were, if I were to take you to Ephesians 5, where all y'all go, and then you went, oh, now you're going to talk about Ephesians 5, how we got to submit to the husband. I'm, I'm telling you right now, I, I ask people when they always get hung up on submission, do you always see what the husband's called to do, to sacrifice? And here's, here's my belief. I believe that women struggle with submission is because men lack sacrifice. So ladies, I, I get it. I understand why you get a little upset about the submission part when the man's not do, acting out on the sacrifice part. Because here's what I believe. I believe if men would sacrifice righteously, women would submit respectfully. <laughs> yeah, y'all didn't like how I put that in there, did you? Well, I don't know. 
And then children, how they're supposed to act. But the, he has an assignment for government. He has an assignment for society. He has an assignment for everything. But when we're out of our assignment, we get out of alignment and things go cuckoo. Whether you're talking about in politics or the home. And so we need the fire of the Holy Spirit and the water of the Holy Spirit. We need refreshing. We need refinement. But there's order to it. Now, let me tell you when he did this. He did it under the headship of a corrupt king. He did this in the midst of a silent people of God. Israel was silent. Nobody was standing up. He did it in the face of aggressive religious people. He was up against Baal. They, they, it's not that they didn't like God. They were anti-God. He was taking them on. He did all that. He didn't do it in a controlled environment. He took them up to the hillside of God. And that's where he took them on. And here, I just want to share some things with you. You need to understand it first. There's never going to be a perfect environment for us to stand. But the environment in which we grow up means stand. As Tony said last week, we have to stand. And stand doesn't mean they're to stand there passively, but to stand there purposely. We have to stand. You don't have to go pick a fight with the enemy. The enemy is already there swinging away. Already there. And I'm going to share this with you next week about the silence that we're experiencing in the church and some of the stuff that's going on, the nonsense that's going on in the church today. And it's not about just ignoring political things. It's, a na- it's just flat out ignoring biblical things. Not speaking truth because we're afraid of offending people. We're so tied up. Come back next week and you hear this again. We're so tied up in crowds and cash that we've sold our soul to the devil. I've said this before, I'm going to say it again. We started this journey three and a half years ago. And I said then, and I'm going to say it now, and this is not to sound, gosh, this is not to sound braggadocious as bold as. God called me to this place under this conviction. It ain't about the crowd, it's about the crown and the throne. You understand that? I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here. I'm encouraged by you. But if all it is, if I get up here and I start appeasing you and I start trying to figure out what to say and how to say it to make y'all keep coming back, ain't going to work. One, I'm not that good. Two, you shouldn't be that desperate. And so when Elijah came there today, he said, we're going to see who God answers. And the God that answers is going to be the God that we're going to worship and the God that is. And I would tell you today, stories are going to be told in this baptism. Landon came up to me. He he reminded me a couple of weeks ago when I was in the Father's Day. said, And I did the thing about the Father and... About the father getting saved, and then the household gets saved. And he started telling me, well, I got saved. And then my wife got saved. And today, my son's being baptized. He's been saved. I believe it. That ain't got nothing. You understand this? Some of you are in here today, and you've come to see a family member's baptized and stuff like that and it's a great thing and and it's a wonderful thing and we're going to celebrate that but can I tell you that would it be that God used this day and this moment to bring you to himself to say to you I've got some water and fire for you I'm calling you to salvation today and you may be sitting there and said preacher I'll tell you what I've heard better than you challenge me with better sermons Well, let me tell you this. I'm not dependent on me or my sermon. I'm asking fire and water to invade your life today to do what no man can do, and that's redeem your soul. That you would come into the presence of a holy God and that Jesus Christ himself would so invade your life that you could no longer live without him. That you'd quit jumping and running around chasing the gods of this world and come to the throne of the only God that made the world that can save your soul today. That's what I'm calling you to. Mm. 
God showed. And listen what God did. That fire came down. It consumed everything inside the trench. It, it was not out of control. Salvation is never about making us crazy. It's about introducing into our life sanity for eternity. And it proves, this is what it proved that day, that everybody there would know that the God that answers by fire is the God. You ever heard somebody say, well, I'll tell you what, if they'll get saved, I'm going to tell you right now, anybody can get saved. That's true with everybody in the room. That we would have such an encounter that we'd say, hey, I tell you what, They've had an encounter with God. Something's different in their life. That you'd leave here today and you'd had such an encounter with God that you don't have to say anything. It's just by the way you walk, the countenance on your face, the lightness to your step, the enthusiasm that people can say, something's different. And then when they hear you talk and, and they recognize some things that are absent, the bitterness, the unforgiveness, the angst and the anguish. And they said, man, something's different. What do you say when that happens? You say, man, I came into some good fire and water. His name is Jesus Christ. And he saved my soul. And some of you go, well, man, that sounds a little in your face. No, it's in your heart. And you bring it right there. You bring it right there. You don't have to hoop and holler. You just need to walk in obedience. So this morning, God may be calling you to an altar. For some of you, if you died right now, you'd know you died and you'd, you'd go to hell. You'd go to hell. And God brought you here today. Not just to watch a family or a friend or somebody like that get baptized. God brought you here today to bring you encounter with him because he loves you so much that he would orchestrate a whole service on your behalf. To say today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of salvation. Come to me. People say, I tell you what, I... I don't, I don't know that I'm ever going to can publicly respond. Can I just tell you something? One day we will all publicly be either delivered or condemned. Publicly, he will proclaim us as his church. And publicly, he will condemn those who rejected him. One day he will show us as trophies of grace who have responded to the call of grace. And he will show us as trophies of grace. It will be a public day in which we bring him glory and he glories himself and us. And it's all public. Then there will be a public day of condemnation in which he will say, depart from me, I never knew you. And eternal humiliation and separation starts at that moment. It will be public. And the Bible tells us that it will be among those of the greatest and those of the least. No partiality. So today, here it is. We're at an altar. 850 lunatics jumping around, cutting themselves producing nothing one Holy Spirit filled man of God says God let everybody here know that you're God and fire fell it consumed everything on that altar inside that trench From the ox to the wood to the stones to the water. Lapped it up. Changed everything. Just that one moment can change everything. 
One moment today can change everything about your life. Everything. For some of you, maybe like me, you feeling a little dry? Holy Spirit, start to nudge on you. I want you at that altar. Ask me. Ask me for some water. It's already in you. You just plugged up the spring. Get rid of the cork. Ask me for water. And I'd just say this. We get dry because we, we start ignoring God in some things. All right? It's not just God holding back the water. It's us not being satisfied with it. And so he won't give us stuff to waste. So maybe you're a believer here today and you're feeling life's gotten a little dry. Maybe God's been ignoring you. He's turned his face from you just to get you to seek it. Maybe you come to this altar today. You think that's it? I have no idea. I ain't God. I'm not the Holy Spirit. I'm just saying. But if there's, one, there's a voice in you nudging you there. Not to make a spectacle. But obedience. Obedience. We need a lot less emotion and a lot more obedience. That's a good word right there. Obedience.